I would like to begin by uh, thanking you, Manolis, Eugenio, and uh, Bernard for your kind invitation to be here today. And uh, also to my co-authors, uh, particularly the students, Alberto Badías and uh, Beatriz Moya, who is uh, sitting there in the, in the audience, that uh, did, of course, uh, the vast part of, uh, of the work I'm going to present today. Well, uh, I would like to begin by defining uh, some concepts that appear in the, in the title of uh, my lecture today. The first one is the concept of uh, simulated reality. Uh, this concept uh, was uh, introduced very recently uh, in a report uh, from the University of uh, California at uh, Berkeley and refers to a, a type, a particular type of artificial intelligence in which uh, there is a, a simulation system that is running continuously behind the scene so as to provide us with the right information about what's happening from the physical point of view. Okay, we have a system running continuously in real time interpreting what is happening, what uh, you are seeing and providing you information that usually is he uh, hidden. So, in conjunction with uh, virtual reality and particularly with augmented and mixed reality, uh, such concept of uh, uh, simulated reality can bring us uh, unique opportunities to develop uh, systems. Systems that uh, we uh, refer to as intelligence augmentation systems. The concept of uh, intelligence augmentation was uh, first uh, coined uh, by uh, Douglas Egelbart, who is uh, here, in 1962 in what uh, it's called the mother of all demos. Imagine, I'm a little bit stressed about, about the working of my videos, about the, the videos that I'm going to show to you. Imagine yourselves in a lecture in which you present for the first time in history the first prototype of a computer mouse together with the first uh, prototype of a Windows uh, like uh, operating system together with the, uh, with the first text editor and the first video conference Skype-like system. All the four things at the same time. Okay, imagine uh, that's what we call uh, the mother of all demos. And in this lecture, uh, Douglas Engelbart introduced the concept of uh, intelligence augmentation. Uh, he referred to uh, augmenting human intellect uh, as a way of increasing the capability of a man to approach a complex problem situation and to gain comprehension to suit his particular needs and to derive solution to the problems. Well, this is the, the, the idea. Of course, there are more uh, recent definitions of this same concept. For instance, in the computer journal two years ago, uh, the editors of a special issue on this topic define intelligent uh, augmentation as the set of technologies that enhance uh, human productivity and improve or restore capabilities of the human body or mind. Of course, we are not considering uh, pharmacological uh, solutions nor uh, psychological ones. We are just considering computer-based uh, solutions to this kind of, uh, of problems. So, at the end of the day, what we would like to, to develop in this uh, research project is a system that uh, is able, in the, firstly, to capture and to reconstruct the three-dimensional uh, environment around us. Second, by means of uh, simulation in real time, it's able to interpret, to understand, to learn about what's happening around, and finally, to provide you with this uh, information, usually hidden to you, uh, by means of a uh, uh, mixed or augmented reality environment. That's the uh, long-term uh, uh, ambitious goal of this, uh, of this project. For this to be possible, we consider different situations. For instance, imagine that we capture with a standard camera, a smartphone, for instance, uh, the environment around you, and we would like, first of all, first possibility, to enrich this uh, video with information about existing physics, what's happening around you. That's what we call augmented reality. Something happening in the physical uh, world, but uh, whose details 
are given to you. Second possibility, imagine that you are developing a new prototype, a system, uh, you are in the designing phase of a new product, and you would like to know how this prototype interacts with uh, physical reality. In this case, we, talk, uh, uh, we speak of mixed reality. Third possibility, uh, you would like to, to see what happens when uh, physical and virtual reality interact between them. So the challenges for uh, such a system are manifold. For instance, first of all, we need a computer vision system able to perform what is called in this uh, community a special artificial intelligence. So, in other words, to be able to understand, first of all, to reconstruct the 3D environment, and second, to be able to reconstruct it and to provide you with the right information. Second, we need to simulate the physics in that uh, environment, and uh, if we think of a uh, video, standard video system, we need to simulate some 30 to 60 frames per second in order to interpret what you are seeing in, in, in your video. The system should be interactive, okay? you, you should be able to manipulate uh, the system, but uh, in particular, we hope to avoid any user intervention in terms of uh, pre-processing and, and post-processing. Of course, we would like to, to mesh uh, your environment uh, operations like, like this. So, first of all, let me uh, begin by giving a very brief overview about uh, the issues related to computer vision, which are not uh, common probably in, in our community. What we have is the typical situation in which uh, I depicted uh, here uh, a solid mechanics problem in which uh, you see a deformable solid uh, evolving, uh, suffering a, a movement, a de therefore a, a deformation, and we are recording this uh, deformable solid uh, with the help of a standard camera, as I said before, possibly a smartphone. The camera is moving, okay, uh, this is the camera represented in two different uh, positions, so the camera also suffers uh, a movement and is providing us with a flat projection of uh, what the camera is uh, seeing as a matrix of pixels, okay? So this is uh, referred to as the uh, pixel uh, space. We need to be able to locate the camera in a world reference frame and not only the position, but also the orientation of the, of the camera, so as to be able to reconstruct the deformation of the solid in 3D. Well, how is it possible? If the solid is rigid, this is a standard, okay? In the computer vision community, this is called the structure from motion problem. And the only thing you need to do is to move your camera. Since you have only one camera and not two eyes as uh, we have, just move the camera so as to record the, the object from uh, several positions. There is a, a very nice application from, uh, from Cornell in which by taking pictures taken by tourists and uploaded to, to Google Maps, they are able to reconstruct the 3D geometry, very detailed 3D geometries of uh, several monuments not only reconstruct the 3D geometry, but to provide you with information of the position of each camera at the moment in which the picture was taken. Okay, this is, this is uh, more or less a standard in, in computer vision. How is it possible? Well, first of all, you will need to recognize equivalent points in different pictures, okay? Uh, very much like, uh, like here. There are, very efficient uh, algorithms to do, to do that. Once you recognize the same physical point in several pictures, by tracing uh, rays from the camera uh, to the projection of these points in the, in the pixel space, and intersecting these uh, rays, you will arrive to the 3D uh, position of uh, each point very accurately. What is the problem? Well, in fact, uh, for rigid scenes, this works uh, very well. This is a 3D reconstruction of, uh, of a lab in the, in the university. The blue pyramids represent the position of uh, the camera at several time instants as uh, it evolves, and this is uh, a standard. It, it works quite well. 
The problem comes when you have deformable solids. Why? Because each frame represents one deformed configuration of the solid. Okay? So we have an ill post problem. We have one single picture for every deformed configuration of the solid. We are lucky, however, just because we are recording at uh, 30 to 60 frames per second. So the difference in the deformation, in the deformed state from uh, one uh, frame to other is in fact very, very small. So well, assume that we are able to reconstruct our 3D environment, and uh, now it's time to interpret what uh, we are seeing. First of all, let's assume that we have a model of the physics, possibly a parametric model of the physics that are taking place in your, in your video. Uh, our approach starts by considering that uh, the physics you are recording in your video, the data is exact. We consider that uh, it is noise-free, which is not uh, exact, as you can imagine, but uh, we consider that the recording is uh, noise-free. We also assume a parametric dependence of the solution on, uh, on, us, on some set of uh, parameters mu, and we describe the problem uh, as uh, the, 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 the set of two different PDEs that we discretize. One is the so-called state equation, uh, set as a uh, uh, matrix that in general will depend non-linearly in, in you, your solution, say the displacement field for instance, and also on the set of uh, parameters. And the, the, the solution itself, u, that depends, of course, on the physical position x and the set of uh, parameters mu. The second equation is the so-called observation equation. Okay? You star that uh, are the information extracted from the video uh, is, in fact, the product of a matrix tree that will depend, in general, on the intrinsic parameters of the, of the camera and possibly also on the set of uh, parameters, and of course on, on you, the solution to, to your problem. So uh, we cast the problem uh, in the form of an inverse problem, okay? Uh, so that uh, the set of uh, parameters mu star that best explain the physics that uh, are taking place in your, in your video are those that, that best uh, explain your observation. That's a classical uh, uh, inverse problem, but that you need to solve at uh, at least 30 hertz, 30 times per second. In, in principle, for very big, very detailed, uh, standard uh, finite term uh, models, for instance, this is this is too much. 30 times per second is uh, too much, and uh, our solution consists in using reduced order modeling. Okay to uh, reduce as much as possible the number of degrees of freedom of the, of the problem by using surrogate models that uh, helps you to, to alleviate this computational uh, cost. In our case, uh, we need, for the reasons I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, right now, uh, what uh, it's usually referred to an affine decomposition of the solution. Many radio order models uh, provide such as an affine decomposition, which is uh, this uh, type of uh, approximation. Uh, this is a finite sum of uh, separate functions. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, for those uh, who are not familiar with uh, reduced or order modeling uh, methods, I will recommend this uh, chapter of the Encyclopedia of uh, Computational Mechanics that describes them very well. For instance, reduced uh, bases provide this type of approximation. Proper generalized decomposition methods uh, provide this type of decomposition too. And the interest in this particular form, in which these uh, cycles here represent the Adamard product, the entry-wise product of uh, functions, because remember that we are, in general, interested in a vectorial uh, solution. Uh, well, the form in, in PGD to obtain such an approximation is uh, to first employ a greedy algorithm in which we obtain one sum at a time, and uh, within each uh, sum, since we have uh, 
as a known product of uh, functions, we apply a fixed point iteration, okay? By computing one product at a time. Finally, functions f that depends on the physical coordinates and uh, g1 and g number of parameters that depend on uh, each parameter of the problem are updated so as to minimize the residual. Okay? In this uh, way, in a recursive uh, algorithm, we obtain such an approximation to our, to our solution. Why it's uh, needed, this uh, type of uh, solution, if you employ a gradient-based approach to the solution of this problem, you will need to uh, obtain the sensitivities of the solution with respect to every uh, parameter, okay? And this is uh, very, very straightforward if you think that the sensitivity towards uh, each one of the parameters will be provided by just deriving each one of these one-dimensional functions, which uh, are described, in fact, uh, in a finite element uh, sense. So this allows us to, to run uh, uh, very, very fast. I'm showing here uh, the first example we, we develop. It's uh, a, a very academic and naive one. It's just a cantilever beam. Okay, we manipulate the beam, and uh, you will see on top of the beam the displacement field uh, as, a, as a contour map. And the idea is that uh, uh, we have, first of all, the raw video, the simulation running in real time at uh, this rate of at least uh, 30 frames per second, and the composition of both gives you the hidden information about what's happening in your, uh, in your video. The system is robust, uh, for instance, for uh, any obstruction, and can provide you uh, with uh, valuable uh, information. Notice that here we don't see the, uh, the actual placement of the, of the load, and however, uh, if we construct a parametric model, we can provide the information about where the load is actually placed in the, in the beam. Well, this is simple. This is just an euler bernoulli navier beam. There is uh, even an analytical solution to this problem. But without seeing actually the load, we can provide you hidden information about uh, what is uh, happening in, in your system. This was our first uh, attempt at, uh, at this moment. Uh, well, for a, a reasonable resolution of the video, we were able to provide you with the right uh, frame per second rate uh, at about uh, 30. Nowadays, we are able to, to do it uh, much better as we see it. Let's move to nonlinear problems, okay? Here we present a, a, a beam made of uh, hyperelastic foam uh, whose uh, constitutive behavior uh, was uh, best described by uh, kirchhoff sambenent uh, law, which is quite limited and has uh, several limitations, but uh, in general, for this particular uh, application, worked uh, very well. This is the strain energy potential, classical, linear elasticity, but under uh, large strain settings, the wake form of the problem, that is doubly wake form, is uh, we, we perform integration not only in the domain, but in the uh, space of uh, parameters. Well, we obtain offline the modes, the functions, that best explain the behavior of the system, only 11 degrees of freedom. This is, these are functions f1, f2, 3, and 11. Okay, the, the modes that explain the behavior of the, of the system uh, from the spatial point of view, and here from the S variable, which represents the uh, position of the load in the system. Okay, again, uh, functions G1, G2, 3, and 11. If we compose all these, we can, again, solve the problem in real time, continuously, at least 30 times per second, running and providing you with uh, an explanation of the, uh, what is going on in the system. Again, the system provides you the position of the load. Now it's uh, visible from the video, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the system is able to locate, to locate the, the load and to provide you f with information like the displacement field, the strains, uh, stresses, and so on. 
Well, for this particular case, we employed, as I said before, only 11 degrees of freedom. Employing 19 doesn't improve the solution very much. For an iPhone 6 resolution, the system runs at 60 frames per second. And the error in the prediction of the displacement field, for instance, is about 1.5 millimeters. But this depends strongly of, uh, on how close you are with your camera to the system, because it depends on the pixel resolution of your camera. Okay? If you place yourself very far away from uh, the system you are interested in, your uh, accuracy will be, will be lower. Well, different uh, nonlinear problems. This is a rubber boot seal a new Hukian, and again the solution is uh, parametric. The displacement field depends non, not only on x, the physical position of uh, your point, but on, on theta, the angle of, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, bar. And uh, here we don't employ any, any marker, okay? Here what you uh, will see uh, is uh, these uh, green points here and the red ones here are what we call ORB features, special points detected by the algorithm that allow you to reconstruct in 3D your environment. Here, the different uh, position in green of the camera, positions and orientations of the camera. You reconstruct, first of all, your environment, okay, in 3D, you position your system, reconstruct uh, everywhere, and then you put your virtual uh, object on top of it. This is the second situation I mentioned before. We have a prototype, and we would like to see how it interacts with the uh, physical reality. You manipulate the bar, and you see how your prototype will behave in a physical uh, situation. Okay? Uh, well, the type of information you provide uh, can be uh, displacements, strains, uh, stresses, etc. In this case, there is uh, even self-contact. In the, in the rubber, and again, the system is uh, robust. Maybe at some uh, situations you can uh, play with the uh, way in which you pro project your information, and uh, well, in general, uh, it works well. It is even very robust, okay? In this case, we are showing uh, the, the stresses. It is very robust in the sense that uh, you will uh, see right now how the camera goes far away of your uh, system. Okay, just a moment. Imagine that uh, we, uh, we have a walk. Okay, we go far away to the backyard, far away of where the uh, system is located, and come back to the original position. Okay, we lose the original position, and the system is robust, it's able to place again your prototype in the right position and to recover the, the situation. Well, this was for the simplest situation in which we have a model that explains the physics taking place in your video. Imagine that uh, we don't have a, a model. And uh, in this case, we need some form of uh, artificial intelligence. In this case, we are considering a, a, an example of uh, the analysis of uh, the aerodynamics of, uh, of a car, and the artificial intelligence system must uh, first be fed by a set of simulations by which we train the system. Uh, our approach is based on the assumption that there exists a manifold in which the shapes of every car lives. In a sense, every car is similar. All of them are for wheels, for instance. So they are uh, very similar to each other. And their geometry, we assume that uh, it lives in a, in a manifold. So once we record with our camera one, of, uh, one uh, arbitrary car, we first reconstruct the geometry of the car and project it onto the manifold of shapes. And by finding the neighbors, the neighboring shapes, we are uh, able to interpolate the physics. In this case, the Navier Stokes flow uh, around the car. So, first of all, we need to train the system to compute offline a lot of different simulations. In our case, only 80, probably some hundreds would be much better. 
we first did refine the geometry of the car. Okay, this is uh, the case of a uh, Ford Fiesta model. We employed this level of uh, the refinement, which is enough in general for the degree of accuracy we are looking for. We embed the geometry of the car in, in a grid, 140 times 40 times 20 cells. And in the nodes, at every node location of this cell, we compute the presence function that takes the unity value if the point is within the car and vanishes it's if the point if is outside the car. Well, with the result of all these uh, vectors, this side, 140 times 40 times 20, we put it in the form of a very long high dimensional vector and these, we assume that these vectors belong to a manifold in a high dimensional space. The objective now is to project this manifold into a low dimensional space where uh, small d is much lower than capital D so as to manage very fast the, the situation. Here in the high dimensional setting, we compute the weights that best explain every car from its uh, surrounding cars. This is the so-called uh, locally linear embedding technique by minimizing this functional f. Okay, here z are these long vectors with ones and zeros representing each car geometry. And by minimizing f, we determine the weights that best, best explain every car in terms of uh, its uh, neighboring cars. Then we assume that there exists an embedding to a low dimensional uh, space, to a low dimensional uh, manifold, by minimizing this second functional G that in turn assumes that the weights are the same, but now look for the uh, coordinates in this low dimensional uh, space here. Well, once we do this in the set of cars we have at hand, we discover that if we project on a two-dimensional space, the set of cars we analyze describe more or less this kind of uh, almost uh, one-dimensional manifold that uh, very well clusterizes the different types of cars we, we analyzed. For instance, you see here in red sports car that are far away from uh, large cars, sport utility vehicles, SUV-like cars, for instance. Uh, here in white, cars that are not uh, particularly different to, to others. We classified them as various. Classic cars from the 60s and, and 70s in this uh, region also. So the, this technique is able to, to clusterize the different classes of uh, cars quite well. So, we take our camera, typically a smartphone, we record our car, we reconstruct all these points around the geometry of the car, given uh, the type of representation I showed before. Here is the position, uh, the different position of the camera and the different uh, physical points. We reconstruct the car, okay? We embed it again in, uh, in a grid, compute the presence function, and transport the result into the low dimensional manifold, okay? And well, this is how, how it works. First, we train our database with as many different analyses as uh, possible. We compute uh, the velocity field for each one, different uh, model, here classical American cars, okay? We compute uh, simulations with your favorite uh, software. We assume the existence of uh, this manifold structure, both in the high dimensional and low dimensional setting. And then we take a tour around a new car, okay? The, imagine that uh, this is a car that is not present in the database. You record the car uh, by turning around and capturing all these uh, different uh, points, okay? The, your physical environment, and, uh, well, this is, uh, as I mentioned before, what we call ORB features of the, of the image that uh, are actually three-dimensional points in, in, in this space. And this will allow us to reconstruct the, the physics. We transport the car to its neighboring zone 
in the, in the manifold, and by interpolation uh, in the database, we are able to obtain the type of information you are looking for. Uh, for instance, stream traces, uh, flow pressure, velocity field, uh, any type of information you are interested in. Okay, uh, how much does it cost? Uh, well, this system runs in real time, 30 to 60 frames per second. The reconstruction of a car takes, on average, some uh, 30 milliseconds on a MacBook Pro. Uh, the embedding of the geometry in the low-dimensional manifold takes, uh, on average, less than one second. And uh, the L2 uh, norm error with respect to the ground truth to the result of uh, the simulation done by Abacus, for instance. Uh, for instance, in the case of a Hammer model, it was about uh, 1%. Uh, in the case of the, the model, which we call the seven number four, about 0.5%. Uh, so it's really accurate uh, how it's able to predict uh, the, the velocity field around the car. Well. To finish, uh, what happens if we are interested in the interaction between uh, uh, virtual reality and physical reality? Uh, for instance, contact between uh, a virtual object and physical ones. Well, in this case, uh, we employ again, of course, PGT radio order model uh, for, the, for the virtual solids. Uh, the virtual solid is represented as a point shell a set of points in the, in the boundary that will be responsible of tracking uh, the, the contact. And the physical points will be equipped with a, a distance field. In this case, the distance fields will be obtained not by a standard camera, but by a, a stereo one, a camera with uh, two objectives, okay? Uh, this camera is able to provide you with a distance field with respect to the physical objects. And once uh, one of the virtual objects crosses the, the zero level of uh, the distance field of the physical objects, we apply a uh, penalty force just to enforce uh, the non-penetration of both uh, objects. This is the well-known Stanford Bunny. And in orange, uh, this is represented the, the, the point shell, which will be responsible of uh, taking care for the contact. Okay? So this is the type of information a stereo camera provides you with the uh, distance field uh, in an automatic way. You don't need to reconstruct uh, anything. It will do it uh, for you automatically. And the result looks uh, like, like this. Imagine the Stanford bunny, a virtual bunny on top of your table in your, in your office anchored, of course, uh, in a given uh, physical position. And uh, at this moment, you are able to play with the bunny. The bunny is uh, hyperelastic, uh, large deformations, okay? And, uh, well, since the system is computing the distance field in real time, it's able to, to, to detect where, when your hand, the distance field to your hand is crossing the boundary of uh, the model you are uh, manipulating, okay? This opens uh, really a new whole range of possibilities of uh, introducing uh, mixed reality in the industrial design, for instance. Okay, well, uh, in conclusion, uh, we believe that uh, nowadays computational mechanics uh, is in the position of uh, giving artificial intelligence a different point of view by providing very interesting uh, physical explanations about what's happening around us. And uh, we, as a community, have, have the opportunity to, to explore this uh, new field and to provide uh, the classical computer science-based artificial intelligence uh, an alternative way of uh, seeing uh, artificial intelligence. Now the problem will be probably what happens if we don't have any model explaining uh, the, the physics around you of, or even if you have a model but the model doesn't provide the right explanation. So uh, at this moment we are working in the possibility of uh, developing models on the fly or uh, 
possibly to correct models in the fly if the predictions the, they are given uh, are not uh, entirely satisfactory. And uh, for this is, uh, as I said, uh, the objective of uh, our uh, research. And for instance, Beatriz Moya will be given, uh, will be showing you the results of this type of approach in this session that begins just after the, the coffee break. Thank you very much for your attention.